David, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Now, wh- uh, what is your position at the Daily Poster? I know you launched this thing. Are you the uh, uh, the editor, or does is- that not work that way? Offici- the- officially, the title is troublemaker, uh, problem creator. Uh, no, <laughs> and I'm the editor, reporter, player, coach, that kind of thing. Uh, it has been great, and I've been citing your work probably uh, weekly um, in uh, over the past uh, several months that you've been doing this. Thank you. And um, and I want to talk about one of the stories that. Uh, you guys broke months ago that actually had an implication in New York. In fact, there's a whole rolling series of things that I think um, uh, some of your reporting has created in New York, or at least part of it. And and I want to get to that, but I want to talk about uh, what's happening on the national scene. You and, and so let's just start with where we are in terms of like the the. Uh, Biden has introduced both his inf- or uh, one tranche of the infrastructure plan. This week, he introduced the taxation plan. It is a little bit um, pre-negotiated, I guess, relative to where it was during the campaign. Uh, early in the week, the parliamentarian says there can be multiple forms of reconciliation, though I don't know that anybody's clear and really what that means quite yet. Um, and maybe you can help us out there if you have a sense. And then uh, Feinstein says she might be open to the filibuster, and then Joe Manchin closed everything down. Uh, give me your sense of what's going on. Well, I, first of all, I always tell people, uh, having worked on Capitol Hill, that um, people perceive politics, I think they want politics to be house of cards, but politics is more like Veep. Uh, people running around not knowing anything. So the confusion over the reconciliation, the confusion over the filibuster, uh, this, uh, m- my view is, is that there's no grand master plan. It's like everyone, it's just sort of a free for all. Um, I think the notion of the uh, reconciliation being used uh, to do the things that the parliamentarian has already said cannot be done is sort of absurd. I think the entire creation of the idea that you can't uh, ignore the parliamentarian or fire the parliamentarian is actually a level of insanity that even in my own imagination and my imagination can run wild. I, I, it's hard for me to believe that that has now become a thing. Like the the idea that the media reports on the parliamentarian as some sort of like you know, infallible, immovable, like the Democrats put that out there. They, 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 they use it as kind of like a, oh, we can't do it because of the parliamentarian. And the, the, my reaction is that's an eye roll. The parliamentarian is literally a, a, an advisor to Chuck Schumer. It's sort of like Chuck Schumer. It is like Chuck Schumer blaming his own advisor if, if, that, if th- that, that's what that is. And yet this is now taken as an article of faith that if the parliamentarian says the minimum wage can't be in there or this or that can't be in there, then there's nothing the Democrats can do. It's, it's, just, it's just not true. It's, it's, it's just false. Uh, there are plenty of things that they can do. Uh, so my overall view is that short of getting rid of the filibuster or at least limiting the filibuster, Yes, you, you got to then try to use reconciliation for whatever you can use reconciliation for. But if you basically preserve the filibuster and preserve the idea, the fake idea that the parliamentarian gets to decide everything, then you are foreclosing on major uh, initiatives that you have promised to voters. And there's just no way around that. And, and, and that is and you're doing so in a way that it doesn't sort of you have an excuse, right? This is an outside force. And if we have to create that outside force, then we create that outside force. I mean, uh, that's, and it feels so, all right. So, and I think that's, that, that seems clear to, to me. And, and I think, uh, uh, many people realize that, I mean, you and I were, I mean, you and I have been talking politics probably in this context for uh i don't know 16 17 years yeah, that's how old we are <laughs> yeah. and um and and uh there was i think multiple occasions uh when uh, during the bush administration maybe at least once where they got rid of the parliamentary and they just said like you know what we don't like the way that you're advising us so goodbye um, so, I mean, it's not like it hasn't been done before. Um, and, uh, and, and this dynamic of using outside sort of um, almost like acts of God, like these force majeures as like, this is why we're not delivering this is, is, is pretty standard fare 
uh, as it goes. And so, uh, but but let's talk about what's going on with Joe Manchin. And and I think like your point that it's more like Veep than House of Cards. I think people really have to understand this. Like they they even in the White House and maybe even particularly in the White House particularly with joe biden and i want to get to sort of like a broader conversation about this with you they're just they're just reacting to it's, it's every day is just a series of reactions what do you make of the op-ed that joe manchin uh, uh you know published two days ago because it seems to me that he's just sort of done a 180 on his talking filibuster um if, if give me your sense of that and, and why he might have done that i mean i just think he he uh, i think he doesn't th this is a, a nice way of putting it but i think he either doesn't know where he actually stands he's actually almost thinking out loud and doesn't actually have a set principle at play and uh so he's i mean th that's a nice way of putting it a, a, a less charitable way of putting it is that he enjoys being at the center of, of controversy. He's a narcissist. He's, I mean, John McCain, and, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to stomp on his grave or whatever, but like John McCain was the same kind of way in the Senate. John McCain enjoyed the circus revolving around John McCain. Like you could argue that like John McCain had relatively a few clear principles. And the principle was that John McCain had to be at the center of the controversy. And so I think Joe Manchin is kind of leaning into being the guy that everything swirls around. Now, what's kind of sad is that the only reason Joe Manchin is that guy is because he's a senator who's who, on the Democratic side is willing to, to play that role, right? I mean, any individual Democratic senator could play the same role, granted in a different way, but you can take that if, if, if in a 50-50 Senate, you need all of the Democratic senators for to, to, to pass something, then any single Democratic senator could kind of play this kind of game. Now, it's true that most of the senators say, at least publicly, the Democratic senators, that they want to reform uh, the filibuster. And so Joe Manchin is leveraging uh, his sort of situation to stay at the center of the controversy. And my guess is that part of that is he just likes being at the center of the controversy, right? I mean, like politicians enjoy attention. The, <laughs> the political system self-selects for people who enjoy attention. And then the other question is, is like, what is he leveraging that for? Like, what what actual power is he leveraging that for? And you know, we at the at the Daily Poster, for instance, we reported on the on the tax bill, uh, a related uh, situation. You know, why is he suddenly uh, saying he doesn't want uh, the Biden proposed twenty eight percent corporate tax rate? Like, what is that really about? He he only now he's sort of saying. First, he was like, I, we we you know, originally he said I want an infrastructure bill and I'm for raising the corporate tax rate, but now. 28% is apparently some problem for him. He wants it at 25%, which seems unbelievably arbitrary, like the difference between 25% and 28%. So what's that really about? And that's when we reported and we followed the money that he's gotten a significant amount of campaign cash from a, a, a particular industry that bet big on the corporate tax rate. So this is a little convoluted, but hear me out. The private equity industry, the Wall Street guys, you know, the Gordon Geckos of Wall Street, after Donald Trump's tax bill lowered the corporate tax rate from 35 to 21, a bunch of these big private equity firms bet big on the 21% corporate tax rate. They converted themselves to C corporations, okay? To, and that was a business bet on the 21% a tax rate. They were betting their businesses on that tax rate. They had previously been partnerships. That industry has given a lot of money to Joe Manchin. It's actually given a lot of money to the super PAC that also boosted Joe Manchin. Uh, so if Biden raises the corporate tax rate even to 28%, presumably it's not good news for those Wall Street giants that bet big and cannot, by the way, revert back, right? They're locked in. They can't go back to being what they were. They're locked in to uh, a, a corporate structure that that is reliant on this corporate tax rate. So Joe Manchin is essentially going to bat in a very big way for some of the biggest private equity firms uh, in the world. And there's a kind of a sad irony, or maybe irony is not the right word, but like, here's a senator from one of the poorest states in the country who is effectively going to bat for the billionaires 
for, like in a direct way. I'm not talking like, like billionaires sort of like metaphorically. I'm talking about like literally the moguls on Wall Street, right? The Gordon geckos on Wall Street, the center of one of the poorest states in the country going to bat for these moguls. Not, he's not like a New York senator or a Connecticut senator representing some of these guys in, in Greenwich or, or living in, in Manhattan, right? He's going to bat for them to try to keep their tax rates low. And so I think with Manchin, again, I guess it's a long way of saying, politics, he likes being at the center of attention and always follow the money, right? The, the guy's got to raise a lot of money to run for re-election in, in West Virginia. That's, I mean, that's that that's fascinating. And, and I will say this, I mean, to be fair, I mean, I, I, I it, you know, the the it shouldn't come as a surprise to people that po politicians want to be in the center of things. I mean, and I, you know, I, I look, look at what I'm doing for a living. I, I'm also, you know, I'm just literally sitting here in the center of of a of a set. So I, you know, I, I can understand that um, that. Uh, that um, you know, desire, I guess, and and some people, it's uh, greater than others. I used to work in show business, and it's not hard to find people who want to be who who just that's their north star. It's not even a conscious thing. It's just like if there's an opportunity, that's where they gravitate towards that. And uh, the tax thing is really fascinating because it it, it strikes me as like if Biden had said thirty one, Manchin would have said the real number is twenty eight. <laughs> But but the point that you're making here, I wonder if because it feels like he reversed himself on the um, uh, on the filibuster. And the interesting thing about with the filibuster gone, if you're talking like the his sole uh, desire was to be that guy, that leverage point, um, getting rid of the filibuster would make him arguably. And maybe Kristen Cinema, but I think, you know, Manchin, because he's coming from a state where, you know, that's the difference between, let's say, a Joe Lieberman and a Joe Manchin. Joe Lieberman was coming from a blue state in Connecticut, and, and we spent a lot of time talking yeah. about it back in the day. Manchin comes from a state that voted overwhelmingly for Trump. I mean, so he, he at least has some built-in narrative that could justify it on some level. But this guy could spend the next at least two years, anyways, or a year and a half, to be the complete, like, whatever he wants, uh, Joe Manchin could get from the Democratic caucus. But there are times where I think, like, there are some politicians, and I, maybe there's a, all the politicians, don't want to be that guy. Like, they don't want to be in a position of making or breaking every piece of legislation that comes by because they're stuck between two different, there may be some big donors and maybe, like, uh, one of the poorest states in the country. Like, how do you justify these votes? And maybe he doesn't want to take those votes. Well, I mean, I think that's a good point. And I also think that there's sort of a, I mean, we're, we're sort of circling around this, this idea that they're always trying to come up with ways to not be held responsible. The parliamentarian, oh, it's not me, it's the parliamentarian. Oh, you know, the filibuster, it's not me, it's the filibuster. And we, and we have to preserve this institution because of, you know, and by the way, the, the, the nonsensical argument that the filibuster must be preserved to preserve minority rights. Minority, and we're not talking about people of color, we're talking about like the minority of, of the population is so absurd on so many levels because here's the thing, and, and this, is, this is like not in the conversation, which is to say that the Senate, by virtue of it being two senators per state, preserves significant power, disproportionate power, for the minority of the population in the country, because uh, even at 50 votes, there are there are 50 Senate votes that can represent a minority of the country that can still block anything in a filibuster-free Senate. So the filibuster actually takes an undemocratic institution, inherently undemocratic, and makes it like insanely undemocratic. But the idea, you hear this all the time, but we have to preserve the filibuster in order to make sure that the Senate remains this special place where minority rights are disproportionately represented. But that's a lot of crap because a simple majority vote in, in, in with all the small states can still stop anything it wants in a 50-50 uh, vote situation. So you're right to ask the question, like what is Manchin's real agenda? What does he get out of this? And by the way, and I'm not saying that there's a conspiracy here, but like, what does the Democratic caucus get out of pretending 
or saying that they want to end the filibuster, but having Joe Manchin, but them being able to say, well, look, Joe Manchin represents a Republican state. He wants to look like he's bipartisan. We can't get rid of the filibuster. In other words, lots of people are actually benefiting from Joe Manchin trying to stop the end of the filibuster. The Democrat, even the Democrats who are able to issue press releases saying, I want to get rid of the filibuster. I'm for X, Y, and Z, you know, preserving the filibuster still prevents them or or makes it easier for them to say, look, I, I said I was for, you know, this, this and that good thing, but I just couldn't do it, right? That, that's how politics perpetuates status quo. From your perspective of having worked in um, uh, in, in some of those uh, Senate offices and, and congressional offices and, and frankly, governor offices as well, if I remember correctly, how much how much of that is the, uh, like how much of that plays into this? Right. Like that notion of like uh, I come from a blue state. There's an expectation that I would be to get rid of the filibuster. And I'm not, I, don't, I have nobody in mind uh, here. Maybe Chuck Schumer. But uh, but I have nobody in mind. But uh, but uh, and I come from a blue state. I've got to. There's much. There's so much pressure on me to be um, to come out for that. Uh, Joe's doing me a solid here, and down the road I'll do Joe a solid. And and I, like I'm convinced that you know I don't know how many of those votes against the fifteen dollar minimum wage uh, Sanders amendment, um, which incidentally needed 60 votes to pass anyways so they they all those uh, democrats could have voted for the minimum wage amendment and it still wouldn't have been yeah. amended and but you ended up getting eight when really you know supposedly only two of them were on the fence about it That's right although chris coons has some issue with like uh you know restaurants or something to that effect um how much of that was like, we're going to give cover to these guys because down the road, we're going to try and bring them into something else or how much, how conscious of, of that is, is that dynamic? My view is, is that a lot of it is what isn't done versus what is done. And by that, I mean that if Manchin is willing to go out there and singularly stop filibuster reform, there is, in my view, there are certainly rank and file Democratic senators who may not be all that upset with that, even though they're issuing press releases saying, I, I really want to get rid of the filibuster and are subsequently not necessarily willing to use what power they have to make life uncomfortable for him. This is the part of the story that's really not discussed, which is that Yes, Joe Manchin is doing the Democratic Party a solid, if you will, by being a Democratic senator from a tough, uh, red-leaning state, right? I mean, so, so that, oh, you know, we have to be careful about how much we pressure Joe Manchin because Joe Manchin represents a, 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 a you know, a, a purple state. Well, the executive branch, as an example, has lots of power to d discretionary power to decide where federal spending happens, where it doesn't happen. The uh, different chair people of the co of the Senate in the Senate of committees have lots of discretionary power to decide whether Joe Manchin gets X, Y, or Z that he's demanding. So mobilizing that power uh, to make it uncomfortable for Joe Manchin to continue being a problem on the filibuster, that's the part of, the, of this situation that, that's hard to see in real time, right? But that, but that when we say, you know, are, are people going up to Joe Manchin and being like, hey, man, I'm, really, I, I, I'm putting out press releases saying I'm against the, I'm for the for filibuster reform, but hey, thanks for doing that. It's, it's, it, I think it's more like Joe Manchin's going out there making filibuster reform impossible. And there's a bunch of Democrats who are like, maybe in their own minds, they're like, look, I'm, the, the, I don't actually have a problem with what he's doing. He's like doing me a solid here. And so like, I'm not going to like, if I'm chairman of some committee, the appropriations, committee, I'm not going to like mess with his, his appropriation that he wants in West Virginia. I'm not going to like bring pressure to bear on him to actually move. And that goes all the way up to the White House, right? I mean, when we talked about the minimum wage uh, situation, one of the things that we were writing about at the time was that any Democratic senator or, or any group of House members in a narrowly divided House could have said, listen, we're not supporting the American Rescue Plan unless it has a $15 minimum wage in here. Uh, we're going to be sort of an anti-mansion, right? And the reason to do that is not to take down the bill the, because it was a must-pass bill. I don't believe it would have been taken down. The reason to do that is to actually mobilize the White House to use its power 
to create a deal to bring pressure on the other side of the party, that you, you need to actually mobilize the tools of pressure. Joe Biden, as an example, I'm sure was like thrilled that he didn't have to actually really get off the sidelines on the $15 minimum wage, really get into the, into the muck of like, okay, I got the progressives over here going to take down my bill if it has 15. Manchin's like saying he's going to mess with the bill if it, if it has any minimum wage increase. I got to actually mobilize the tools of the White House to create an actual deal that puts something in here. I'm sure Biden was like, this is sweet. Like the progressives aren't threatening to take down the bill. I can just deal with Joe over here. I don't really, I, I don't have to like get into the mess of this. And, and that's the way it's going to be until there is actually a, a need for the White House to actually mobilize those powers to actually push Joe Manchin. Now, will 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 it have a hundred percent success? Like, will it definitely move? Because you hear all the oh, you know, even if the White House tried to, th this whole idea, the president's powerless now. You know, like, oh, we wow. hear for four years Donald Trump's the most powerful person in the world. Now, oh, Joe Biden has no power. He can't do anything. He can't move. He can't move. It's it, that's a lot of garbage. Will it audit, Will it be successful hundred percent of the time? No. How will it be successful sometimes? Yes. How how credible though? I mean, this is the this is the difficulty, right? And this is the difficulty that um, you know we heard in the context of like the fiscal cliff at different times, you know, over the year. Like, how credible of a threat is it when I don't know, um, you know, uh, pick whatever uh, progressive you want in in the Senate comes to Joe Biden and says like I'm not going to vote for the rescue bill a uh, bill uh, unless we get the fifteen dollar minimum wage, and Biden goes oh, really. I mean, really, like, well, I, I mean, you're speaking to a point which is like, if you're going to make a threat, you have to be willing to follow through on it. And my view is my view is, is that saying early, honestly, and upfront, if there's a piece of let's let's use the infrastructure bill, OK, the infrastructure bill, in, in my view, that the what the progressive should do, whether in the House or Senate, is say, here is what we need to be in this bill. We're going to say we're not going to wait until the end to, to you know, to right. play a game, to right. tell you, you know. From the very beginning, it must have X, Y, and Z. If it doesn't have X, Y, and Z, we're out. Like you just can't count. And we're going to say that early and upfront. And now it's your problem. Like, and 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 a fifteen dollar minimum wage, as an example, is is not some sort of like, you know, you're not asking for something like insane or something like super radical. Like this, like we're asking <laughs> our X, Ys, and Zs are the things that you promised, right? So like that's it. Like that's where we are. And the progressives haven't been willing to do this. Now, you, here's a good historical analog where the Republicans uh, did this. If you remember, uh, it's a totally opposite issue, but if you remember during the bank bailouts, okay, the middle of the financial crisis, George Bush and like all of the most powerful people in the entire world through Ben Bernanke and, Hen and Hank Paulson come to Congress and are like, listen, the entire global economy is about to melt down for uh, like the whole world is going to like literally explode unless you pass a three page bill giving the treasury a complete blank check to spend whatever he wants at any time forever. Right. And the Republicans were basically like, uh, yeah, no, we're not we're not passing that bill. And, and they they dug in, they drew a line. They said, we're not passing a bill that's like that. It's absolutely ridiculous. And then the and 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 I'm sure Bernanke and Paulson were like, you can't be serious. You can't really be serious that you're going to follow through on this threat. And they followed through. And what happened? What happened was is that a week later they bring back a much bigger bill, a much longer bill, putting in at least some safeguards. Now I was, you know, the bill was still a joke. It was still a, you know. Right, right, right. Atrocity. But at least it was like, OK, like there's going to be a congressional oversight panel. There's going to be this. There's going to be that. And guess what? They voted it through because it was a must pass situation. So the point is, is that the whole idea of like, we're going to create demands. And then if you don't meet the demands, we're not going to vote for this bill. And oh, my God, you're going to take down the bill permanently is just belied by what actually probably would and could certainly could happen, which is that the bill goes down, gets voted down. Guess what? Congress is still controlled by the Democrats. Guess what? The president is still a Democrat. You just bring back another bill and you have to actually deal with the people who made the demands and followed through. Right. Um, uh, that's a, that's a great um... That is a great uh, uh, analogy. I remember that. And, 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 you know, that was a must pass bill. Yes. I know. I, I knew I knew uh, b bankers 
who were telling their uh, significant others at that time, take out every dollar you can at the ATM. Like there was a sense that the entire thing was going to fall down. Yeah, so I'm, I, and I don't want to be, I'm like, like, look, I'm not saying the Republicans were acting, the House Republicans were acting like in good faith or whatever, but like they understood power. They were like, we're just not, this is, I'm sorry. Like it, you're going to have to put some things in here that we, that we're demanding. Now their demands may have been like unprincipled or they didn't really believe in it or whatever, or they were just political showmanship. But like, that's, at least at minimum, they showed an understanding of how power actually works. Right. right. And, and, and um, I, I, for whatever reason, there is not, and, and I, I guess it's really just a question of like how many uh, of, of uh, Democratic senators are willing to do that. And uh, you the answer know, right now? Zero. Right. Zero. Right now. I mean, and look, I want to be, it's worth saying, well, why aren't they willing to do this? Just because they're like weak. I think a lot of it is like they're just weak and scared and 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 there's even more nefarious, you know, they're, they're not only are they weak and scared, they're complicit in, in, in actually not wanting these policies. But I think for the, you know, for the people who are acting in good faith, I think they struggle with like, look, there's a lot of good things in, in the American Rescue Plan. I'm afraid that if I go too hard, like, the, I, you know, the, the progressive side of politics has never played this kind of hardball in the last 50 years. So like, what if we do this and we just, we just ruin every, we, we blow it. Like we, we've miscalculated. And, and like, I get that, but like at some point you, you have to like roll the dice. Right. I mean, the, the fear is, and this is, I can understand this as a fear. Like what if, what if Joe Manchin just doesn't care and is decides like, I, I you know what? The Mitch McConnell came over and said, you know, do I want to be chair of the energy? Uh, I'm going to be chair of two committees. And guess what? I'm a Republican now. Well, you know, saw it happen to Jim Jeffords. Saw it happen to um, Specter back in the day. Mm -hmm. And if I'm a Democratic senator, I'm going like, I want people to get 1400 bucks, you know, or, you know, even though it wasn't 2000 or whatever. And I want, um, I want that $300 a month child tax credit. And that has a chance if, you know, who knows to maybe be made permanent. And if I get up there and say no $15 minimum wage, which, you know, some people are saying maybe we'll get another bite at this apple in a bit. Um, well, but I mean, I think, look, that's why it's all about frankly, mobilizing Biden. And we'll go back to the $15 minimum wage thing. I think that what could, here's an alternate reality that I don't think is like insane, right? You had 10, 15, 20 House Democrats say, we can't vote for this unless it's got $15 minimum wage. Manchin saying, I don't want anything. Uh, I would accept 11. Right. Kristen Sinema is from a state that's got 12. If the progressives say we can't vote for this without some sort of minimum wage increase in it, you've now created the conditions for Biden to swoop in and be like, hey, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to at least do 13. OK, we're going to and I'm not saying I'd be happy with 13, like 15, you, know, you need 15 or whatever, or at least you'd get Biden. Uh, listen, I can't give you 15. I can't give you a minimum wage increase in this. But I am committing that in the underlying bill of my infrastructure bill, that's coming right after this. There's going to be 15 dollars in there. At least you get like a commitment, like something like something concrete, anything like they walked out of the American Rescue Plan with like like a night, like maybe we'll do $15 at some point later, you know, there was nothing because, and there was nothing because the, the bar, the negotiate, there wasn't a negotiation. There was not a demand that was made. Do you think the infrastructure bill has the same level of urgency that this could be leveraged in the same way? Well, that's a great question. And, th and that's actually the, pro oh, you know, th it's such a, it's so interesting because the American Rescue Plan's necessity the emergency that is it was happening and the, the need to pass it was cited as a reason to not push too hard for a $15 minimum wage. But in fact, the way power works is that that gives you the precisely the best chance to actually make it happen because it absolutely had to pass. And rank and file members of Congress knew it had to pass no matter what was in it, right? That's the whole, like I worked for the uh, the House Appropriations Committee, right? The House Appropriations Committee, when I worked for it, it there was like a sort of a, this, this standing understanding that because the budget bills have to pass, they are a moving train, they, they must pass to fund all the basic things of government that anything you could like toss onto the moving train could, would probably pass no matter how like kind of crazy or insane it was because you need the, you know, you don't want to be accused of, oh, you're, you're standing against the troops or oh, you're standing against public schools or whatever. 
that th the point is that the people who understand understood the process the best back then, who got so many things done uh, uh, through that process, were people who understood that the more acutely the nation needs a piece of legislation, and that rank and file members feel like they have to pass a piece of legislation, the the more you should actually try to put your 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 initiatives onto that legislation because that gives it the best chance of actually happening. Right. Right. And so it's unclear whether this infrastructure Correct. Bill yes. has that same sort of compulsion. And and that's the problem is that you get one of those must pass bills rarely. That's and right. Really, I mean, and that, you know, uh, God help me for 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 quoting um, Rahm Emanuel. Yes. But you don't want to let. Uh, you know, a crisis can be an opportunity type of situation. Yes, we we share the same mind because that was the, literally the quote that when you were saying that went through my mind too. Right, and it's so distasteful to even have him <laughs> to, to raise his name. Although I will say in my defense, I think it was one of those like corporate uh, uh, posters that it was like a, a Chinese character. And, oh, totally. And, oh, look, and by the way, every crisis is an opportunity. Go back to the TARP bill. Right. Yes, every crisis, it was an opportunity to bail out the banks, right? right? It could have been an opportunity to bail out America. Instead, it was an opportunity to bail out like, you know, Lloyd Blankfein and Goldman Sachs. Indeed, indeed. And all right, so let's talk about just a little bit about, so, and it, and it still just, I guess, remains to be seen as to what Joe Manchin's doing. I, I for one, don't think his op-ed locks him in in the way that other people are saying it is because I don't think anybody like, that op-ed is not for people in West Virginia. No, no. Like it's not. There's nobody. There's no scenario where Joe Manchin's uh, Republican opponent says, look what you wrote in the Washington Post about yeah, the no. filibuster. And now then you went in there and did a talking filibuster. It's either there's one of two things. It's either I, A, he wants, you know, the Joe Manchin Civic Center in West Virginia. And that's going to be part of the earmark. Near <laughs> in whatever bill it is, uh, or um, he's been told by his donors, like, there's some votes in there we don't want you to take. And yeah, yeah, yeah. and this is the and, and he's like, this is the way I don't take that vote. Uh, I don't, you know, there's no, there's- Look, there's certainly an out, I mean, for him. I, I, you know, this is a guy who has made clear he's willing to be on different sides of an issue when he perceives it to be, you know, in his interest. Certainly, you can imagine two, three, four, five, six months from now, something happens. He can say, listen, I didn't, you know, I, I've, I've, the Republicans did X. We need to pass X. And like the only way to do it is that I'm not saying he's going to do this, but I'm saying there's a way for him to, 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 to be on the other side of this like next week. Easy. I mean, he said no under no circumstance, but then you could say like, it was a failure of imagination. I just couldn't come up with the circumstance. Exactly. So with that said, two days ago, and it was a day before a mansion put this out. So possibly Chris Coons, um, I, I, Reuters reported that Chris Coons said, we're going to give uh, until the end of May to the Republicans. And then we're going to do this alone. And, and when Chris Coons says that he's speaking for Joe Biden. Absolutely. Right? And, and so um, the the way this works in terms of pressure Joe Manchin doesn't care if uh, anybody listening to this interview, you know, sends an email to Joe Manchin or a letter and says, you've got to vote for the filibuster. Joe Manchin cares if Joe Biden comes in and says, hey, man, uh, you know, look, you know, I'm the Joe's president. You're the Joe's senator. We got to do this. Yeah. How does that happen? How do how do we pressure Biden to like where or, or do they feel that pressure and they're just they're figuring it out? So my guess is if. if my, um, I guess, positive, optimistic view is that so many things will end up piling up. Like this, the House will pass all of these initiatives. The Senate will make a spectacle of trying to pass a bunch of initiatives, including you know, voting rights and, and, and the infrastructure bill and all of Biden's stated priorities. And there will just be this backlog sitting in the Senate with 50 votes uh, 50 Democratic votes cast for them, but can't get through. And then the pressure will be on Joe Biden to, the, the question will be like, where are you? What are you, what are you going to do? Now, what will try to diffuse the situation, and, and I think that pressure would be, that, that sort of, that sort of conflict, that, that crescendo will be where that's what you need to actually break the filibuster. But short of that, what you will see is an effort to try to use reconciliation to insist 
that the filibuster isn't necessarily needed. But again, the problem with that is, in my view, you can, again, as an opponent of the filibuster, right. you can say, we want to preserve the filibuster, but we're going to use reconciliation in an aggressive way. The, the, what makes this, this situation untenable, truly, is we have the filibuster and we're going to use reconciliation, but continue to pretend that the parliamentarian can basically render reconciliation much weaker than it needs to be. Like, in other words, recon if you're going to go with the whole idea that we can sort of circumvent this through this ridiculous process, then you have to, at minimum, be willing to like aggressively use that process and not pretend that the parliamentarian is can, can block any that the parliamentarian is effectively a filibuster right like one of those things has to change right and so my, my guess is that if they if they don't really want to get rid of the filibuster that this whole parliamentarian issue is going to have to to change otherwise like like what's going to happen like all these things are going to pile up. The Democrats are going to insist that they can't do anything about it. Voting. Nothing is going to get through. Oh. The Republicans will, will will make a whole thing about how the Democrats, you know, you know. And by the way, don't underestimate the Republicans creating gridlock and then also criticizing gridlock. Like they're the ones <laughs> making sure nothing is happening, and then they'll bash the Democrats for say, for for not getting anything done. All right. Look, I know you have a hard out in a couple minutes, so I just want to go over this quickly. Um, you, Andrew Cuomo is under siege in about four different ways. He's got um, he's got the the, the sexual harassment uh, charges. He's got um, uh, well, he he moved and covered up the uh, the deaths in nursing homes. And you guys wrote a story. I don't know how many four or five months ago was it? I, I can't even remember when it was. Almost a year ago. Almost a year ago. Okay, yeah. um, saying that. Um, uh, uh, making the, drawing the line between um, uh, Cuomo signing a, uh, a a bill basically to say no liability for these nursing homes and for uh, hospitals, uh, you can't sue them for anything that they do in these practices, and uh, ended up getting some some nice uh, campaign contributions. Quite a coincidence. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's, oh, I'm sure it was a coincidence. Yeah, I mean, our story was basically we broke open uh, the story that. One of his biggest donors, a healthcare industry lobby group, pumped about two and their lobbying firms pumped about two million dollars into his political machine, and he slipped provisions into the New York State budget, this giant budget bill, right, like a couple lines into the budget bill, extending liability protections from frontline uh, nursing home workers and medical workers. Right, nobody disputes that that's a that that that's legit. Like the doctors, nurses. Uh, extending them explicitly to healthcare industry executives, CEOs, corporate board members, and the like. The people who are making the decisions about staffing, the people who are making the actual decisions about how a nursing home runs. He extended liability protections to them. Uh, at, and the group that gave him money bragged that it drafted the provision. Uh, so think about this for a second. The Pandemic is happening. People are getting sick and dying in nursing homes. He slips legislation into the budget, shielding the corporate executives from lawsuits and the deterrent, by the way, that's the key thing, is that a, a corporate decision maker is gonna be less inclined to make cost cutting dangerous decisions if they know at minimum they could face a lawsuit. He shields them from that right after he's taken a big amount of money. And then he's, withholding the data about the explosion of deaths in these facilities. I mean, this is one of the most corrupt uh, and tragic, really truly tragic situations that's happened. And we reported a series of stories about how then that legislation in New York, the provisions were copied and pasted in other states, like word for word. Mitch McConnell uh, copied and pasted that liability immunity section uh, from New York, put it into the Republicans' uh, plan. Uh, so this was a terrible uh, situation. Uh, and we also reported a story about how, you know, uh, months later, uh, people, families who's, who had lost family members, uh, they were being stripped of their legal rights. They couldn't get legal representation because no lawyer wanted to take their case. Now, this story has a, a, a good ending. I mean, you know, a, at least a silver lining. I mean, 15,000 people died. That, you can't fix that. 
But New York legislators, Ron Kim, uh, Senator Alessandro Biagi, a bunch of other progressives uh, who were kind of uh, came in, uh, who were kind of against the Cuomo machine, they ended up successfully uh, passing legislation to repeal the corporate immunity. And Cuomo actually, uh, I think it was uh, a couple of days ago, uh, was essentially shamed into signing a repeal of his own corrupt law. So in a sense, I mean, you can't really like celebrate like, yay, like, you know, 15,000 people are dead. So you're not really celebrating, but actually feel like it's like one of the first times I can remember where like something wildly corrupt happened, like wildly, like grotesquely corrupt with awful human circumstances. And actually the process, now granted there were other, you know, Cuomo's facing all sorts of scandals. So I'm sure that sort of helped weaken him, but actually they repealed it. So so there is a kind of silver lining there. Yep. And we'll talk more about that. I know you got to go. David Sirota, The Daily Poster. Folks should go over and sign up for your uh, emails. It is, um, uh, like I say, I, I end up citing it at least once a week on this program. Uh, David, always a pleasure to catch Thanks, up. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's great to see you. Thanks again.